here's, here's a really cool story. So 17 years ago, we did our first service at an at a elementary school over in uh, West Chandler. Kim and her whole family was there for the first service of the first church we planted. And there was a, there was a call to respond to the, to the gospel. And her entire family that morning made a decision to follow Christ 17 years ago. And uh, that's awesome. So Kim is, is a wonderful, Mary Ann is wonderful, Paula, I mean all of them. So, and what a great area just to help alleviate some of the burden. We never want ministry to be a burden on anyone. And our primary goal is to make sure Kim and Mary Ann get a chance to be out. And we call this big church. This is big church. That's little church back there. So um, for them to have that, that rest they need. And any one of you could help out with those kids and do a fantastic job. So thanks, Ryan, for, uh, for highlighting that area of ministry. And thank you, church, for being so awesome. A couple things real quick. One is uh, tithes and offerings. You guys are just, just knocking this thing out of the park. And we're just praying. We're really praying right now. And you can pray with us. You know, Sozo 2, Missio Day 2, doing another one of these someplace in the valley. And that's what we're really praying about, going, God, why are you not only bringing us resources like finances, but you're bringing us people, too, that have an idea of uh, and a heart for expanding the reach of the, of the gospel and the love of Jesus through a model like this. And so pray for us. We will keep you guys posted. Thank you for your generosity because we can go further, faster when we uh, unite and, and are part of the thing together. And so really excited about the future and what God has in store, and we'll keep you guys kind of up to date with what's happening, but at the bare bare minimum, just pray for us, and just wisdom and direction, amen? Secondly, I just want to, uh, I just, you know, over the years, I've just accumulated so many resources. Over these past few weeks, we've talked about bibli- uh, biblical masculinity and femininity, and now we're talking about sex, all part of this Genesis study, and, you know, uh, I've been influenced by so many people, and I just, you know, you need to know that there are people like John Piper and Robert Hicks and Paul David Tripp. Uh, that have influenced me and given me some just great stuff to communicate to you. And uh, I would be remiss in, in, in letting you know that I'm, um, I'm vociferous. How's that? Vociferous when it comes to influences and books and teachings that I then go, man, that's good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with the church. And you need to know that I'm constantly just learning and growing myself. And I get to pass these things on to you guys. So thank you for being a wonderful fellowship, wonderful body. Um, let's pray. We'll dive into Genesis again and talk about sex again. Uh, and if I had it my way, I'd talk about sex every Sunday, but we're not going to do that. I promise you that. So father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for loving us, for giving us your mercy, your grace through Jesus, for putting a new song in our mouth, father, and, and ultimately in our hearts, touching our hearts, changing us, Lord, so that now we're able to live for your glory, your honor. Show us how that looks and, and give us the power to do exactly that. And thank you for the time now to dive into your word. Be glorified in it. Thank you, Father, for for loving us in Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. While you have your finger there, turn to Matthew chapter, uh, uh, Mark chapter 7, where we're going to also be this morning. And um, uh, I was watching the Oscars last week. I'm probably the only one in this room that watched the Oscars last week. And I'm a movie fiend, and you guys know this about me. And best movie of the year, The Shape of Water. I didn't think it was the best movie of the year, but I did see it, and I love Jesus, so imagine those two things coexisting in the same sentence. So The Shape of Water. Here's what's interesting about The Shape of Water. If you haven't seen it, um, it it is an interesting film because it deals with, on one level, sexuality, and how sexuality has run amok in our culture. And, And what I mean by that is you watch The Shape of Water, and there's so many different sexual threads running through this film that ultimately it just lends itself to living in a culture where we're sexually confused people. Now, in the movie, there is a theme of uh, a, a heterosexual marriage relationship where sex is it's, it's very almost violent and forced. And, and I would not endorse a violent or forced sex even within a marital context. So you've got that. You've got on a second uh, theme of, of sexuality, a homosexual in the movie that is attracted to a cafe owner who wants nothing to do with this man's homosexuality. And so you have that second thread. You've got another thread of a dysfunctional marriage uh, between a heterosexual couple. You've got uh, the, then the ultimate thread of sexuality between a woman who cannot speak and a creature that has been uh, held captive from the Amazon in a tank 
and the bond that now exists between this creature and this woman lending itself to perhaps themes of bestiality or even interspecies sexual relationships. And not only that, that the woman who cannot speak, who has this bond with this creature, frequently throughout the movie masturbates. So you have this best movie of the year dealing with now five issues of sexuality I just mentioned to you. But don't miss out on the heart of where every single one of these lines of sexual themes is going. It's about the loneliness inside of every person that longs for relationship. And it's intriguing to me that Hollywood would award a movie like this, the best film of the year, when it has such interesting yet confusing themes in it, but at the heart of it is the fact that we all long to love and to know and to be loved and be known as well. And we live in sexually confused times. As I'm watching the Oscars, it's not only the fact that this movie has been awarded best film of the year, but also to the best international film of the year has to do with a man who has done a gender transitioning into being a female. That wins best international movie of the year. And then frequent acceptance speeches from award winners thanking same-sex partnerships in the audience. I'm holding the remote in my hands while my kids are watching this with us last week. And my wife's like, why are you holding the remote? Because I'm like, you can never, ever tell what may be coming down the pike as far as themes and what you're going to have to deal with with kids. And my kids, are they're in tune. They're like, Dad, what's gay? What's homosexual? What's this? What's that? And now we're having these conversations with our kids. See, this is just one snippet of a very sexually confused culture. And as a pastor, I would be remiss in not addressing these topics, but I'm not going to address all those individual topics. Last week, we talked about God's heart for us as humans and what is a proper way to express our sexuality. And here's what the Bible affirms, and we can't miss out on this. What the Bible affirms when it comes to our sexual experiences is that it is to be experienced between a man and a woman in a marriage environment. All other things are unacceptable in the eyes of God. But what we have to understand, too, is that these things are not just affirmed in the book of Genesis. Jesus also affirms sex is to happen between a husband and wife in the context of marriage. Paul equally affirms this. Because you'll have a lot of people say, well, the Bible doesn't really speak to all these sexual issues. Well, that's not what the Bible's primary theme is about. The Bible is not a book about sexuality. It's about so much more than that. We're going to talk about that here in a moment. Just like I don't have to come up here and tell you that, you know, my wife is somewhere in this room. And so I'm going to go through every woman in this room to tell you who's not my wife in order to get to the point of the affirmation of who is my wife. Right? My wife is not Cheryl, and my wife is not Esther, and my wife is not Paola. I'm going to tell you right now, my wife is Lori. Lori, raise your hand. That's my wife right there. So the Bible is not going to deal with every situation when it comes to sexual confusion. What it affirms and what it puts in the positive is this. God's design is that of a man and woman to be joined in the union we call marriage and for the sexual experience to be experienced in that context. Not only is it anatomically perfectly fitted together, a man with a woman, but also, too, now it's in a context where it's so much more about physical. It's about binding. It's about becoming one flesh, one spirit with someone of the opposite sex in a covenant union we call marriage, with also the objective of multiplying, having children, and reproducing. This is what the Bible affirms. All other things that fall beyond that scope are not acceptable in the eyes of God. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't have a word for us when it comes to the healing and the forgiveness and the restoration that can happen to anyone dealing with specifically the topic today, any sort of sexual struggle, sexual sin, sexual issue. Here's what the Bible is clear on. You'll be amazed. If you've never read the Bible from start to finish, the Bible deals with topics such as incest. 
It deals with topics like adultery. It deals with topics like polygamy and homosexuality and open marriages and prostitution and rape. And some of you are going, that's all in the Bible? Yeah. And yet we look at our culture, and what does our culture struggle with? Well, it struggles currently with the Harvey Weinsteins of the world, gender confusion and gender identity, heterosexual issues as well as homosexual issues, sexting. Let me just tell you, do not take a picture of your privates and send it to somebody else via text messaging. Okay? I sit there and go, what are you thinking? And that's the problem. They're not thinking. Sexting is such a powerful thing among young people because the longing and the yearning to be accepted and to be approved and to be liked, all these things. What about robot sex? The fact that there are companies creating artificial intelligence so that you can program this AI unit to do whatever you want to do and you can also seek sexual satisfaction from it. This stuff is being produced right and left what about even in religion? There's a reason why the Latter-day Saints is such a growing religion because what it promises you, not only on earth as far as some practicing polygamy, but the promise for those of you who attain the highest level within Mormonism, you will have a, a, a celestial sex forever with wives that will give birth, to give birth, give birth, and that is the dream of every Mormon. What about Islam? The fact that if you die for the cause of Muhammad, you will go to paradise where you will be rewarded with 70 virgins. You see how sex is so intertwined in religion and non-religion and so much going on in our culture. And I, as a pastor, have dealt with personally. You will not believe the things I have dealt with, with men, with women, with couples, struggling with fetishes pastoring a man who came into my office with his wife because when it came to their sexual relationship, he had a thing for wearing diapers. And I'm sitting there going, how do I navigate this? A man who came into my office because he struggled with sexual addiction because he couldn't keep away from prostitutes and had contracted innumerable venereal diseases. Men and women who have come to me as porn addicts, prostitutes, men, women who had committed the act of adultery, men who were into orgies, homosexuals, those who had been raped, those who had raped, incense. I have dealt with these things personally. And as a pastor, the number one question is, how do I help these people for the glory of God? I mean, think about it. How, how would you do it if these things came into your life and they were on your doorstep? How would you do it? And, and I guess this morning's message is really geared toward that objective. How do we understand the sexual confusion around us and yet engage for the glory of God? That's key. We have to engage, but we have to do it for the glory of God, and I would say for the, for the good of the gospel. Because with all these situations, our only hope is the gospel. And I'm going to tell you, whether we're talking about sexual sin or any other sin, our only hope is the gospel. You guys are good. Turn to Mark chapter, chapter 7. This is a good place to start because... The Bible speaks in one broad term, this idea of sexual immorality. The, the word that is used frequently in the New Testament is porneia, where we get what word? Pornography. But it's not just girly magazines or you know, uh, porno, porno websites. It's, it has to do with all the realm of sexual immorality. And this is what Jesus speaks to. This is what Paul speaks to. Jesus speaks to it in Mark chapter 7. Check this out. Starting at verse 14. He called the multitude to him and he began to say to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside the man which is going into him can defile him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. 
So let me just, let's just stop right there. Jesus is concerned about our hearts. Okay? He is concerned about our hearts. And if any man has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 17. And when the multitude had entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated. And he declared all foods clean. He said, now don't miss this. That which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. What is Jesus alluding to here? What he's saying is, there may be things going on in your heart. That's not what ruins you. It's when you act upon what's going on in your heart that ruins you. Th this is good news. Because I think so many of us come with, with this, this cowardice before God as if the thoughts and the intentions of my heart is, is what's going to condemn me to hell. And, and God says, in your mind, in your heart, there's going to be a whole swarm of struggles and things you're wrestling with. That's what makes you human. There's nothing wrong with the internal struggle. But what happens is when you act on those struggles, those inner, that inner war that's going on, when you act on it, that is what gets you into trouble. So notice this, what he says, for from within, out of the heart, the men proceed all evil thoughts. From within, out of the heart, you act evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting, wickedness, pride, foolishness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander. Can anyone see their sin on that list? Just raise your hand. The rest of you are liars. And, I, and I, did he put liars there? Because... Those of you that didn't raise your hand, here's what's amazing is that Jesus includes every sin that we could possibly struggle with. And it's so easy to say, well, I'm not a sexual addict, so therefore I'm not on the list. Yeah, but you're a murderer. Well, I've never killed anyone. Well, if you've had hatred in your, hatred in your heart, Jesus says you're a murderer. Guilty! If you've ever told a lie, if you've ever stolen, if you've ever, so you look at the list and it is pretty complete, isn't it? And we all look at that and go, I'm on this list. You're on this list. And what Jesus affirms is the struggle that we all share as humanity. What Jesus is addressing is when you act on the things you're struggling with. This is why when it comes to the realm of sexuality, and specifically, let's just say, for example, homosexuality, homosexuality doesn't send you to hell. Just like heterosexuality doesn't get you to heaven. Amen? People struggle. The struggle is real. What we have to realize is that it's when you act on the things that are going on that do not bring honor to God. That there is a discipline of the heart that must take place. And we're going to get that, to that here in a moment. That is what gets us in the trouble. The fact that you struggle does not condemn you to hell. Amen? Just like the struggle with pride. Just like the struggle with greed. Just like the struggle with, with a stealing. These things are going on in our hearts. And John Owen, the great Puritan writer, said the seed of every sin exists, exists in every human heart. The seed of every sin is in your heart. And so what we need to understand is that Jesus says, these things that go on, they're evil, they're defiling, they've distorted the image of God, but you need to know that you're not ruined ultimately because of these things. And that's what sin does, it distorts the image of God in us, but it doesn't ultimately destroy your design as being one created in the image of God. Write those two words down. We may be distorted, but the distortion doesn't ruin the core design. And that is good news. Because the Bible takes sin very seriously. And even Jesus, when he came, he said, the reason the world rejects me is because it hates what I'm confronting it with. And this is the good news. First point, number one, the help. Rescue in Jesus. 
When it comes to the topic of sexual sins or any sin, this is where we start. Amen? The gospel, the fact that we are all wrecked, we are all ruined, and there are a million ways to shatter the image of God, and there's only one way to restore it, and that one way is Jesus. Here's the hope for all sexually immoral people. For all who have committed adultery, for all who have divorced, for all who are addicted to porn, for all who are homosexuals, for all who are are liars and thieves and, and bigots and racists, your hope is in Christ. This is good news for all of us. Because you may be here in this room and you may say, well, this message isn't for not for me because I'm I'm not a homosexual and I don't struggle with that. Well, guess what? You may be a liar, so this message is for you. You may well, I'm not a liar. Well, you may be, uh, you may have an anger issue. See, the message of Christ is for all. And this is where our help comes from. The Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, chooses to come on a mission to restore. He doesn't leave us in our sins. He doesn't leave us wrecked and ravaged and distorted. He has come to rescue us us. And this is what I want to put forward is this this mission where Jesus, he says, I restrict sex, yes, but you also need to know that he relativizes it to its importance because the message of the Bible is not, this is an anti-sex book. How many people in our culture think that when it comes to the Bible? Like the Bible, all I've heard from Christians is that this is just anti-homosexual or anti-porn or anti-orgy or anti-this. The message of the Bible, while it contains teachings related to those topics I just mentioned, the message from Genesis to Revelation is this. God is on mission to love you as you are, where you are, but he doesn't want to leave you where you are. He wants to grow you and restore the image of God in you. That's the message. Forgive us for distorting that. Forgive us for choosing our sins. There are the detestable sins, which the church loves to point out, and then there are the respectable sins. The sins that, you know, oh, as long as we're talking about homosexuality, I don't have to talk about my covetousness. As long as we're, we're talking about that person's porn addiction, I don't have to talk about my lying and my scheming and my thieving and my stealing. You see how we have the detestable sins and we have the respectable sins. Let me just tell you, all sins are equal in the eyes of God because all of us fall short of his glory. And the ways we have ruined our image is exactly the reason why Jesus came to restore that image. A million ways to shatter the image, one way to restore it, Jesus. This is our help. And what is the message of Jesus? It starts this way. Repent, for the kingdom of God is here. Repent. It's it's where we start. What does repentance mean? It means I must declare, come to a point where I am no longer Lord of my life. He is Lord. And now I'm going to reject the things I desire and accept the things he desires of me. See, when it comes to the Lordship, this is why repentance is key. He's the boss. He is God. He is Lord. And so repentance is where we begin. See, when it comes to repentance, all of us have our little gods we want to hold on to because we like to be in control. Any control freaks out there? That's a sin. And when it comes to the Bible, it is an equal opportunity offending book. Amen? None of us are immune. And yet what is so marvelous is the hope of the gospel found in Jesus who says, turn and follow. Reject and accept. Leave behind and love. This is repentance. And even Lewis, C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, written in the 40s, dealt with the topic of sex and said, if this is something you're wrestling with, go ahead and just kick sex to the curb and focus on the Christ cross because it is the cross that we really must wrestle with. 
We don't start with our sin and try to work our way to the cross. We start with the cross and work our ways out because it is the cross which we want people to be bowled over by. This, this death, resurrection, and burial and resurrection of Jesus, which then is the greatest manifestation of the love and acceptance of righteousness of God, you give people the hope of the gospel and you allow that to be the core of your message and let it work out into their sexual sins, that's the proper way. Because if you start with people's sexual sins and try to get them to the cross, you're going to find yourself to have a hard hearing with that person. You hear, you hear what I'm saying? I don't want people to be bowled over by the gravity of their sin. I want be, people to be bowled over by the love and righteousness of our God displayed at the cross of Christ. That is what changes people, right? That is what changes people. So Lewis says, start with the cross. Why? Because you want people, in Lewis's words, to stop making mud pies in the slums because they don't know what a holiday at the sea around the corner is like. Take them to the ocean, and they'll never go back to the slums. Let them hear the ocean waves, and they won't be satisfied making mud pies. Too many Christians start at the edges and work in, and you lose a hearing for the gospel. I was not a part of the Chick-fil-A deal that happened a couple of years ago. As if my public declaration against homosexuality has to do with me eating yummy, addicting fried chicken. Why? Because nothing in that message tells us about the cross of Jesus Christ. And if you were a part of that, you have not committed the unforgivable sin. You're still loved, all right? But we have a lot to learn as believers when all we want to do is go out and confront people with their sins when we're even hiding respectable sins in our own hearts. And in reality, we need to start with the gospel and let people be gripped by the love of Jesus on the cross. If you start with the sin, you'll have a hard time getting a hearing for the gospel. I love what Tim Keller says. He said this, churches should feel more like waiting rooms to see the doctor and less like a waiting room for a job interview. Why? When we're all in the waiting room for a job interview, it's all about competence and being better than the other person in there. Whereas if we're all waiting for the doctor, we all realize we're sick and need help. This is not about competency. This is about sickness. This is not about, boy, I hope God accepts me because I'm going to get the job more than that person. This is about the fact that we all stand on equal ground before the cross as sinners in desperate need of a rescue and the help has come through the rescuer, Jesus. How dare we as the church act as if our crap is clean and it's not. Because the moment you started dealing with all the sexual sins out there, what about the porn you're addicted to? What about the marriages you've had? What about the adultery you've committed? So let's talk shop, shall we? And none of that is beyond the forgiveness of God. All the stuff I've mentioned is able to be forgiven and be healed in Christ. Amen? The church is a place for the sexually broken. And who is sexually broken? Every single one of us. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Here's what Paul says. Do you guys think this is going, we're, we're getting, we're, this is going to get hotter. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Notice, it doesn't say the homosexuals won't. It doesn't say the adulterers won't. It just says any who are unrighteous and all who are born into this world are unrighteous. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers, nor the men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the revilers, nor the swindlers. It's a pretty exhaustive list, isn't it? Will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. Were past tense, meaning Paul's delivering a message here saying, wherever you find yourself in that list, because you're all in that list. In Christ, you were these things, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. How? Through Jesus. And now you are accepted, and now you have eternal life. Because these things define your past, they don't define your present, and they certainly have nothing to do with your future. That's awesome. Which is why point number two is important. Our hope. The hope 
It's about relationships with Jesus. And first we have to deal with the relationship we have with Christ and why is that a hopeful relationship and the relationship we ought to have with other Christians, which is also a hopeful environment for relational context for us to grow in. So number one, with Jesus. Remember, Jesus is the one who came into the world to confront the world with its sinful ways. Jesus wasn't this milk toast Messiah walking around in Birkenstocks driving a you know convertible cabriolet, listen to Taylor Swift. All right, this is this is not Jesus. Jesus came and said hard things, and yet with his truth, he also brought grace. And perhaps the greatest summation of Jesus' ministry is John chapter one verse fourteen. He is full of truth and grace. Why is this important? Because if you're all about truth and there's no grace, you're just legalistic and fundamental. And if you're all grace and no truth, you're just sappy sentimentalism. Jesus embodied both these things. And number one, he wants us to know that in Christ, it is not about iniquities, but it's about identity. So often, and again, I'm going to just deal with the, the realm of homosexuality because I've had close friends. Matter of fact, one man dated a close family member of mine who was a female, and he came out to her and said, we can't continue this relationship because I am now, I'm attracted to men. And this man and I met, and we cried, and we talked, and we love each other. But the thing I don't want him to go around saying is that I'm a homosexual. Because that's not what defines you. Just like I don't go around saying, hey guys, I'm a murderer. How many people are going to be like, oh, I'm crossing on the other side of the street. Oh, did you hear Scott's a murderer? You know, you're praying with me and with one eye open now in a, in a prayer group, right? We don't, we're not identified by our sins. Hey, here's Larry the anger guy. And there's, there's you know, Pam, the one who struggles with thievery. And then there's Ron who struggles with, who knows what Ron struggles with, but, you know. We're not defined by these things. That's why perhaps a better term for homosexuality is those that struggle with same-sex attraction. We're not going to condemn them because they're same-sex attracted. Right? This is something that they, they struggle with inside, but they are not identified by their sexuality. They are they, they're, they're, they're identified by being created in the image of God. Right? This is what Jesus got to the heart with. He didn't define people by their iniquities. He wanted them to be restored with their identity. The gospel doesn't define us by our temptations, but it defines us by the righteousness we have in Christ Jesus. This is why John, in the gospel of John, write this down, you'll want to look at it later. Nowhere in the gospel of John does John call himself John. He always identifies himself as the one whom Jesus loved. Because there's a radical identification now that he has because of Jesus. And he's not walking around saying, hey, I'm James's brother, or I'm a fisherman, or I'm a thief, or I'm a crook, or whatever. He calls himself the one whom Jesus loves. That's his identity. And we would do well to learn from him. That our sins are not fundamental to our identity. And whatever we may struggle with, whether it's sexual sins or any other kind of sins, they are a part of what you feel, but they're not who you are in a fundamental sense. Because I may struggle with anger, or I may struggle with greed, or I may struggle with pride. Those things do not define me. Amen? Because you are far more than your sins. You are far more than your sexuality. That's why we talked about the stages of biblical masculinity and femininity. And where do we start with? Creational male and female. You are created in the image of God. And therefore worthy of dignity and respect. So I may struggle with these things, but they don't define me. So the question is this. In Christ, will I allow my struggles and my sin and maybe my environment to define me? Or will I allow Christ to define me? Because this is the way of Jesus. Number two point, it's not about attainment, but about acceptance. Praise God, he did not come to save those who are competent. Some of you love to be competent, and I'm going to challenge this because it is those that sometimes are incompetent that are closer to Jesus than those who think they're competent. 
This is why Jesus, when he confronted and he confronts sexual sins through the Gospels, he always goes to the heart behind the sins. So whether we're talking John 4, where you have a serial, serial adulteress who's had five husbands and now she's living with a guy she's not even married to, Jesus isn't sitting there going, you horrible woman, how dare you do this? But they begin to talk about worship and the heart that wants to be loved beyond any human relationship. And Jesus goes for her heart. Because obviously she hasn't found in men what she's ultimately desiring that can only come from God. John chapter 7, the woman who is a prostitute who comes into the Pharisee's house and goes right to the feet of Jesus and she stoops and cries and pours her perfume and weeps and is broken and Jesus doesn't despise her. He doesn't turn her away, but he says to the crowd there, let me show you forgiveness because this woman who has given herself to every man in town or a lot of them is just desperately broken at the feet of Christ. And he says, those of you in this room, you think you're competent in the ways of religion? Well, here's this incompetent woman who understands what brokenness and repentance looks like, and he forgives her while the other men sit in pride and unforgiveness. Her greatest need was forgiveness, just like your greatest need and my greatest need is forgiveness as well. And then you go to John chapter 8, and you have the woman caught in the act of adultery, and all the religious leaders bring her to Jesus and say, what do you say we should do with her? And they're all licking their lips because they're thinking, stoning, stoning, like this is a day for stoning, right? And they all pick up their rocks, and they're ready to pelt this woman and kill her because if Jesus says she's innocent, well, he's clearly violating the law of Moses, but if he says stoner, then he's lost the reputation to be a friend of sinners says to them, if you're here and you're without sin, if you're here and you think you're competent, if you're here and you think your life is perfect, by all means, step right up and cast the first stone. From the oldest to the oldest, they all drop their rocks and leave. And now it's a half-naked woman in Jesus. And Jesus says, where are those who are, who are trying to accuse you? He says they're not here. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Acceptance before attainment. The gospel is not change, and then maybe you'll be accepted. The gospel is know that you're accepted as you are, where you are, messiness and everything. And watch how God changes. But don't you dare go to someone and say, you know what? You really need a shower in Christ, but go ahead and take a shower before you take the real shower because the pre-shower is going to be important as well as the second shower. You come to Jesus with all your filthiness and with all your baggage, baggage and all your distortions and all your sin and all your iniquity. And you find that he is a Savior who says, I don't condemn you because John chapter 3, verse 17. This comes right after John 3, 16, one of the most popular Bible verses in the world, right? Here's what John 3, 17 says, For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. God will deal with all unrighteousness at some point in time, but for right now, the body of Christ, the hands and feet of Jesus, i.e. the church, ought to be, like Christ, a non-condemning entity that says all are welcome to Jesus, no matter how thick your crap may be. Amen? So, Jesus says, be like me. Accept people. And if the gospel is going to take root in their hearts, if they're truly repentant, change will happen. And I, and I, I so feel for us as a church, because I think there's people here that think, I can't be in that room with those people because they have it all together. And we don't. Yesterday, I'm yelling at my boys. And I have to apologize to them for my anger. Am I still accepted here? And I'm the pastor. What did you do yesterday? That maybe... You're, you're hesitant to confess. How about this past week? 
Is there something you did, something you said, someone you offended? See, what we have to realize is that we're all works in progress, amen? Philippians chapter 1, 6, he is faithful to begin that good work and he will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. We are always changing. We are always growing. We will never attain perfection this side of eternity, so let's extend one another some grace, shall we? We love each other and we accept each other because that's how Jesus has, has treated us. But we also want to encourage each other to pursue Jesus with all of our heart. We'll talk about more about that here in a bit. So what about us as Christians? I'm going to be hard on you guys, just so you know. Because we have done a miserable job in representing the spirit of Jesus in our world. Miserable. We wonder why evangelicalism is tanking. It's because we have missed the heart of Jesus in ministering the, the, the spirit of Christ like I just talked about. So with Christians, and I'm part of this camp, Okay, I'm not the outside guy just throwing rocks. I'm part of this. Two things we need to understand. Number one, our ministry is not about condemnation. It is about compassion. We have not always been a voice or place of love and grace. We treat some sins worse than others. And I say, how dare us? How dare we try to condemn other people's sins when we've got a whole host of sins we need to deal with? And the church sees, the people see the church as, you know, you got to do one of two things. You either alienate those who are struggling, or you either affirm those who are struggling. And it's like the world says, those are your choices. And I say Jesus offers a third choice, amen? Affection. You show great love. Grace and truth, right? I'm not going to alienate you because you struggle with something that I may not understand. I'm going to show affection to you. And neither am I going to affirm what God has clearly said is not right. So I'm not going to sit there and pretend to coat this with something that, doesn't, that God doesn't want to address with, but I'm still going to show you affection in that. See, there's a third way, and we as Christians, we understand Ephesians chapter 3, that we have lost the power of the witness of Christ. Why? Because Paul says the church has an amazing responsibility. Ephesians 3. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. We are here to show the manifold wisdom of God to the world. And how are we doing that? We're not doing it very well. And we're all culpable in this. And Jesus says, number one, in order to be a powerful presence, it's not about condemnation, it's about compassion. Jesus was moved for his love for people, and these people were being destroyed by sin, and he said, I will not sit by and allow their lives to be destroyed by sin. I'm going to love them. And that's why you've heard me say before, love is the most powerful apologetic. Just love like Christ and let God do the rest. See, I have this little thing on my phone, and it's a little diagram, and it says, you know, how to make your life easier. There's a little circle saying the things I can control, and there's a bigger circle of the things I can't control. You're a whole lot better off just dealing with the little circle of the things you can't control. And what can you control? You can control your love for all people and let God take care of the rest. Amen? And so, all humans want to be loved and known. The problem is the church says we love, but we don't know people, and that just leads to sentimentality. And we know a lot of people, but we don't love people, and that leads to rejection. When you say you know somebody, but you don't enter into a love with them, you are essentially rejecting them as a human being. This is why we have a lot to learn from Jesus in being the friend of sinners. How is grace and truth combined? Well, I'll tell you, an elder at this church and I one day went to the workplace of a man who was being abusive towards his wife. We took a Saturday out of our schedule, went down and confronted this man. Why? Because we love him. And yet he was mistreating his wife. There was a sin going on in the marriage, and me and another elder went with the spirit of love, yet truth. And this is the way of Jesus. We affirm the relationship, and we say we're, we're in this with you. We are in this with you. Lest we be guilty of 
Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, right? The second most popular verse in the world. The first is John 3, 16. The second is Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not lest you too be judged. Here's the problem. When you love the person, you not only tell them the truth, but it's what you do after you tell someone the truth that determines whether you're judging them or not. Are you willing to stick around? be a part of uh, the pursuit of Jesus together. Because you judge someone not when you assess their position, but when you dismiss them as a person. Point number two. This is why this is important. Because this is not about policy, but about personhood. I don't care about your statement of faith. I don't care about the, the doctrinal statement you put together and say, here's all the things I'm for and here's all the things I'm about. What I care about is, is, do you love people that are like you and not like you? See, I, I entered a season a number of years ago where I made it about policy and not about people. There was, a, there was a string of divorces going on in a church that I pastored. And instead of dealing with all those couples individually and coming alongside them and helping them see the healing that could be found in Jesus... I thought, I'm going to take the easy way out and just put forth a policy of saying why they're all wrong, and that came back on me because now I'm not a friend of sinners. And I'm a pastor. And how dare I make it about policy when in the core of it, it is about people. It's about personhood. It's about seeing people being having that image of God restored in them, and you don't restore image through policy. You restore image through Love. So we're not affirming, but we're not alienating. We're showing affection. And the church needs to do better in this. Amen? The church needs to be better in loving people. Your responsibility is to love, and you leave the rest to God. The world will know you're my disciples by your love for each other. Love is the most powerful apologetic. Number three, the healing, the restoration that found in Jesus. Three things, and this is, where, this is where the rubber meets the road because it requires discipline. To repent and follow Jesus, it's a lot of work. I'm not, I'm not trying to sell you a bill of goods and say, you know, following Jesus is easy. It's not. And, and here's the hope that God will heal us when we pursue him. What that healing looks like, I don't know. But I know there's three things that are entailed in this. Number one, this is not about sexuality, but about surrender. And whatever sin you may be dealing with, insert it where sexuality is. It's not about greed. It's about surrender. It's not about pride. It's about surrender. It's not about anger. It's not about malice. It's not about slander. It's about surrender. That every area of my life is to be surrendered to the lordship of Christ. The sins are secondary issues. The heart of surrender is primary. The issue is, are you willing to surrender to God no matter what he says? That I'm not going to live a life where I nitpick or choose from the buffet of scriptural insight and say, well, I like this, but I don't like this. This is delicious. This is not so good. And I just kind of pick my way through the Bible. Either this is the word of God in its entirety and I accept it and I surrender to it even when I may not like it. Because there may come a verse that says, never again drive import cars. Well, how am I going to accept that? Well, there I got to go buy a Ford, I guess. Even though I really like Hondas, okay, I'm going to buy a Ford. Because why? Because God's word. What if God said, Scott Morgan... You love music, but here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to listen to, you know, Madonna for the rest of your life. I may not like it, but God's word says it. I mean, let's all be honest. Have we not come across places in God's word and we go, I don't like this. God doesn't say, do you like it? <laughs> God loves you enough to say, I don't care if you like it. I'm God, you're not. Let's establish a relationship. And so, if God's word says it, I'm going to submit to it. You know, there may be some part of my, my sinful heart 
that says, boy, I would love to have sexual relationship with someone other than my wife. But God says, you be faithful to her and you don't have an eye for anyone else. I'm going to submit to that. I'm not going to give in to it. Matter of fact, Lewis in Mere Christianity on his topic of sex says, we don't give in to every one of our impulses or our urges. We don't live like that. So what I do is in the context of my relationship with what God says is good, I submit to a fight against every other desire that's going to compromise that. Right? And so whatever it is that God says you do because he declares, that's what I do. It's not about being defined by my sins, being defined by my identity. And now that I'm in Christ, I want to live for him and I'll surrender to him whatever he wants me to surrender to. Number two. It's not about delighting, it's about denying. This is why the invitation to follow Jesus, he himself says in Luke 9, if anyone wishes to follow me, let him take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. What? I've got to deny myself good things? Sometimes you say no to a good thing in order to wait to say yes to God's best. Amen? Sometimes you sit there and go, this thing is not good for me that I think in the ultimate run of this, I'm going to allow God to determine what's good. And so I will not seek a course of delighting in whatever I want to indulge in, but I will seek a course of denying because that's what it means to follow Jesus. So in the last church I pastored about 12 years ago, something interesting happened. I noticed we, had, we were doing two services. There was a group of women that came in. And again, I don't want to stereotype and I don't want to just throw out a caricature. But I could detect that this was a group of women that were lesbians. Just by the way they looked, and, and I got to talk to them after one of the services, and there were probably about eight of them that came in together. So I'm going, okay, this is interesting, God. What are you up to, right? So I'm talking to this group of women that were there. One woman pulls me aside from that group and says, would you have time to talk this week? I said, by all means. So she called set up an appointment, we met. This woman sat in front of me and admitted that she is in a same-sex relationship. But her follow-up question was interesting. She said, what does God think of my relationship? And there began a journey of helping her understand God's design. You know, I didn't condemn her. <laughs> it wasn't like, well, how dare you even sit in this office, right? Like, no, no, no. She initiated, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give her time. I'm gonna sh and we began to navigate God's design of who we are as human beings. And she started crying. She's like, no one has ever told me this before. And I began to weep with her. Now my next question wasn't, so now that you know the truth, are you going to change your life? That, that wasn't part of the conversation. The next question was, what do you know about Jesus? She's like, I don't know. And I shared the gospel with her at this moment. And we're talking about the gospel. So now the topic is not her sexuality. It's about the love and kindness and compassion of God for her. And she said to me, if I accept Jesus, do I have to change my life? And I said, I believe ultimately in time, that's what the gospel demands. I said, you don't have to change your life now, but what you will see when you taste the gift of forgiveness in Christ is that you're going to see your life change. That may happen. And she left, I never saw her again. God meets people in their place of desperate need. But some people don't want to relinquish the right they have, they think, over their own lives. When in reality, in Christ, there's things I'm still learning 30 plus years later in following Jesus that I need to give up. How about you? When you came to know Jesus, were you perfectly all signed, sealed, and delivered, ready to go to eternity because you were perfect? No. But the message is this, denying yourself doesn't mean I'm going to tweak my behavior here and there. 
It means I'm going to say no to the deepest sense of who I am for the sake of Christ. It means that the gospel demands everything from me, so therefore I'm going to live, and I'm not going to sit there and go, I'm going to make minor adjustments to my life so I just barely get into heaven. I'm going to make major adjustments in my life because this is what the gospel demands. And we will journey with each other together to that end. How much are you willing to give for the kingdom of God? Because I'm going to tell you right now, you will lose everything as you follow Christ. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Number three, and I'm going to close with this. Your journey with Jesus as you surrender, as you deny yourself, it is not about avoidance, but it is about amazement. And here's what I mean. God wants to break the power of sin in your life, and he wants to set you free. That's the ultimate goal. He wants to break the power of sin, and if Jesus showed that he's powerful enough to even kick the ass of sin, death, and the grave, he's going to kick the ass of sin in your life. Amen? You can tweet me on that. I don't mind. Totally. He's going to set us free. So our message is not, stop sexually sinning. That is not our message. Our message is behold your God. We're not going to be preoccupied by sin. We're not going to be preoccupied by our sexual sins, our our monetary sins, our prideful sins, our greedy sins. We're not going to be preoccupied with that. It is not about avoiding all the sins and making sure we live every day avoiding the sins. We live every day going, there is a treasure greater than my sins, and that treasure is Jesus. That's what I'm going to be preoccupied by. So my life is being led by a Savior who amazes me. And as I live in that amazement of how awesome he is, I'm avoiding my sin. This is why we don't bring up someone who's dealing with pornography every time we meet them. How are you doing with the porn thing? How are you doing with the porn thing? Because that's not who they are. That's why I, if I'm talking to someone who has same-sex attraction, I'm not always dealing with the homosexual issue. We are going to talk about Jesus because he is the treasure of all treasures. Amen? We are amazed by him because Jesus says, behold your God. And those of us in Christ are now preoccupied with amazement versus avoidance. I am not daily living my life checking off the list of sins I did or did not do that day. I'm living my life in constant awareness of the amazing fact that God has loved me as I am, where I am, and continues to show me unlimited mercy, grace, and forgiveness every single day. So my treasure is not my sin. My treasure is that Jesus has loved me and will continue to do so forever. And so the win, you guys want to win? You want to know how you're doing? For struggling? Struggling Christians, which is all of us, with any sin, sexual sin or whatever, our win is not that the temptations would go away. Our win is that in the heat of our temptations, Jesus would be prized more than we want our sin. That's the win. That I want him more than I want the sin. And that he is my treasure, and in him is the deepest satisfaction for the slaking thirst of my soul that anyone could ever experience. That's the win. Amen? A lot of sweating, a lot of yelling. There's a world out there that's dying, you guys. And we're not helping move the needle in their lives when it comes to the love of Jesus. I want to recommend a book to you. A woman by the name of Rosaria Butterfield picked up this book called The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. She was a woman in a lesbian relationship for 10 years tenured professor at Syracuse University, very outspoken on women's rights, women's liberation. A pastor and his wife chose to love this woman, and she falls and surrenders to the Lordship of Christ. And this is her journey, and there are helpful things in here as you navigate the topic of of sexual sins in general. Her testimony will bring you to tears. What she writes will do an incredible healing, I think, in your lives. And especially as you seek to go into a world to bring the healing of Jesus to other people's lives, very, very, very good book. As a matter of fact, World Magazine named it top 10 books of the year when it came out about probably eight, 10 years ago. So I recommend this. I'm going to post a couple things on the Facebook page for Missy O'Day. 
One of them is the C.S. Lewis lecture on sexuality. And even though he wrote, said these words 70 years ago, they're very applicable today. So I'm going to post some stuff out there. And if you're struggling with any sins, specifically sexual sins, I want you to know, please reach out to me. And this is going to be a bold step because you're probably used to being judged and condemned if you can come clean with any sin or imperfection in your life. And I want you to know, if the Lord so prompts you to reach out, I want to help you in the journey. And if that means you're a man who's dealing with porn, I want to be there to help you in this journey because I have also dealt with this in my own life. If you're a woman who's addicted to porn or you know you frequent prostitutes or you have same-sex attraction, whatever it may be, here's what I want you to know. You're going to find the spirit of Jesus here. A spirit that doesn't condemn, but a spirit that is going to accept you and love you, but will also help you in the journey because we are a family, we are a community. And we are not going to alienate you. And I'm sorry for the ways that you've experienced the opposite of the love of Jesus in your experience. But I want you to know there's something different here. And if you'd be so willing to reach out, I want you to know my promise to you is that you will be loved and we will help you in the journey to love Jesus more than you love anything else. Amen? Anything you would add to that, babe? Brenda, raise your hand. There's Brenda right there. Awesome. Kelly, where are you at? Right over here. Um, Donna Fagerberg right here. These are these three women are deacons here at the church. They are on the leadership team. I love each of them. Ladies, reach out to them. Deacon men, raise your hand just so people can be aware. Any one of these guys. There's Tim right there. There's Kevin right there. There's Mike right there. Where else? The other deacons are out smoking. But other than that, <laughs> it's the way we roll. I mean, if it was afternoon, they'd be out there with a pint of Guinness. And they, oh, yeah, we got to do church. So, um, There is no sin so deep where God's love and grace is not deeper than that. You need to know, you need to hear that. You don't go to hell because you struggle with same-sex attraction. You don't go to hell because you struggle with porn. You don't go to hell because you're an adulterer. Or you, those are not unforgivable sins. You go to hell because you don't have Jesus. Amen? More than anything, I want you to have Jesus. Let's stand. Lord, merciful to me for I am a sinner. We stand before you a holy God who would have every right to condemn us. But we're here today because you are a kind and merciful and gracious God who once again has interrupted the flow of our lives to remind us of the greatest thing any human could ever do, that while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. Christ dies for us. It's good to hear, Father, that there's nothing that we've ever done or committed or thought or entertained in our hearts that cannot be forgiven and healed in Christ Jesus. It's good. We need to be reminded of that, Father. Thank you for the message of hope in Christ. And we know that there, this is a journey. This is progressive. That perfection in our, our daily lives is not given to us automatically, but the journey is so well worth it. As we seek to love Christ more and more every single day. Thank you, Father, for sending us Jesus, for giving us hope. May your will be done in our hearts and our lives. May you be glorified in everything we do and say. Guide our steps, Father. Give us wisdom. And especially as we seek to take this message to a world that is fractured, it is distorted, it is, it is weighed down by the weight of its sin. May we go with a message 
that these things can be alleviated because of the love of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for today. Guide us, be glorified through us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face towards you and be gracious to you forever and ever. Amen. God bless you guys. See you soon. Thank uh-huh.